Chris has participated in a number of Australian Royal Commissions and inquiries with the Federal Australian Human Rights Commission. He has been Professor, professor of Criminology at Cairns Institute James Cook University, Professor Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences and Faculty of Law, University of New South Wales, and is Professor of Criminology Jambana Institute for Indigenous Education and Research, University of Technology, Sydney. His work displays a strong interest in human rights and social justice. Please welcome Chris. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and the meeting with you today pay my respects to their all past and present. Uh, I'd also like to particularly thank Ben Perkins for organising the conference and for the invitation to speak. Um, so, look, I wanted to talk about uh, raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility and the arguments for that. Um, currently in Australia, the minimum age at which a child can be held criminally responsible their actions is 10, uh, and that's uniform across all the states and territories in the federal jurisdiction. I'm not suggesting that raising the minimum age is going to solve all the problems in juvenile justice, it's certainly not, um, but it's a very important reform and it will have a significant impact in relation to Aboriginal kids and Torres Strait Islander kids uh, for the reasons I'll, I'll come to in a minute. But it's not the only thing we should be doing, but I think it's a, an important thing that we need to work on. Now, there have been many organisations, NGOs over recent years, academics, lawyers associations that have been pushing to raise the minimum age in Australia. Uh, the NT Royal Commission, as Claudia mentioned earlier, has a recommendation in relation to that. A couple of weeks ago, Judge Peter Johnson, the head of the Children's Court of New South Wales, also gave evidence to the government, government uh, inquiry, suggesting the age should be raised to 12. So it's a bit of a movement a bit of movement now and it's something of a possibility to make this change. Um, there's a coalition led by Amnesty International, UNICEF, uh, National Aboriginal Child Strait Islander Legal Services and other organisations uh, that's been working politically. Um, I've been part of that. I had meetings with, with Dreyfus, the Shadow Attorney General, Pat Dodson, some of the other Labor Senators, uh, about getting it on the ALP election platform. Uh, and some of the states and territories uh, are showing some interest in, in the raising the age. So it's an important moment and possibility where it actually might occur. And just out of sort of interest, the last time we raised the age, uh, which was from eight years to ten years, was back started back in the mid 1970s with uh, New South Wales and Queensland being the first two states to raise the age from minimum age for eight years to ten years. That was in the mid 1970s. So it's quite a while ago. Um, in terms of the reasons, I've only got 25 minutes and, and there's, there's multiple reasons why we should be raising the age. So I'm only going to speak very briefly about uh, uh, some of those. Um, and there is a paper which is referenced here on this front page of the uh, PowerPoint which goes into all of this in much more detail. And my understanding of Meg's have put the PowerPoints up on... Uh, the Facebook page, is that right? So you'll have access uh, to it there. As a point to start with, I think it's important to remember that, that most young people, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, that are in juvenile justice have multiple and complex uh, needs. Most of, many of them have had experience of one or more of the following that's there. I'm sure you all know this very well in terms of entrenched uh, poverty, uh, fragmented experience of education, exclusion, expulsion, poor educational outcomes, often in out-of-home care, um, and various uh, mental health disorders uh, and cognitive disabilities. And most importantly of all, in terms of the arguments that I'm putting here, many in juvenile justice and most in detention are Indigenous children. In terms of the international comparisons, uh, Australia is an outlier um, with a minimum age of 10. Um, and significantly, in terms of what David was talking about in the previous panel, uh, so is England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Most jurisdictions across the world have an age which is much higher. The average age across the European Union 
uh, is 14 years. Um, and you can see some are higher than that. Uh, Sweden, Denmark, where it's 15, uh, or Belgium, where it's 18, uh, although there are some of offence exceptions to that. So internationally, Australia uh, has a very low wage, uh, and that is important in terms of the context of our meeting here because it particularly impacts on Indigenous children. So the international comparisons in themselves are not an argument why Australia should raise the age. Maybe people would say, well, Australia's doing it right, the rest of the world's doing it wrong. But at least what it shows us is that it is feasible to raise the age of criminal responsibility, um, but it doesn't appear to have any adverse effects in terms of crime. It's not as if all the rest of the world is out of control in relation to juvenile crime, and we're not. Um, so one, re one, of, one, I suppose, result of the international comparison is that there's no adverse effects if you raise the age. Um, many of the countries that have a higher age also have fewer older children in detention, and Germany is an example of that. And that may well be because they don't have this young cohort that have come into juvenile justice at 10, 11, 12, escalating and progressing through the system. And many of those countries that have on a higher age, uh, again, Germany is an example, uh, also have less punitive approaches to juvenile justice overall. There's also human rights arguments. Uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has been consistently critical of Australia uh, for 20 years now because of the low minimum age uh, and uh, recommended that it be attended to it. And no doubt the Human Rights uh, the UN uh, sorry, Committee on the Rights of the Child will be critical of Australia again when it releases its report uh, later this year uh, on Australia's performance in relation to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, generally speaking, the Australian Government responds to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child by arguing that we have a doctrine of dolly incompatence, uh, which applies to children from the age of 10 to 14. Now, all it's one of those you know, fancy legal, Latin legal terms. All it means is, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, is that there's a presumption that children under the age of 14 uh, do not know that they're criminal conduct is wrong, and it's a requirement, at least as a legal principle, a requirement that the prosecution demonstrate to the court that the child actually knew that their conduct was seriously wrong. And I want to say a few things about that, because this is what the government, governments rely on in terms of justifying a low minimum age. There's not a lot of research about how this principle works in practice, and that's the key thing. How does it actually work in practice, rather than being an abstract principle. And the evidence, particularly from research that's been done in Victoria, is that it doesn't work well in practice in terms of preventing young children from coming into the criminal justice system. And part of the reason for that is that the threshold for um, demonstrating that the child knew what they did was seriously wrong has been weakened over the years. The sort of evidence that might be presented by the prosecution can be relatively weak in terms of demonstrating it. And also that the, the burden has increasingly fallen on the defence, that is the lawyer that's defending the child, to actually demonstrate that the child um, doesn't know what they did was seriously wrong. So the onus has moved from, from the prosecution more to the defence. And that requires the defence to be able to initiate uh, psychological reports and so forth. They pay for psychological reports. Uh, to be prepared for the court. It often means that the child may be held in remand until a date for the hearing can be set. Um, and we know, particularly in terms of legal aid commissions and Aboriginal legal services, that in a period of diminishing uh, funding from those organisations, there's less and less money to be spent uh, in terms of preparing uh, those psychological reports. Furthermore, the research in Victoria said quite clearly that it was very difficult to get confident children's child psychologists to prepare those reports. And they were talking about Melbourne uh, and, and Victoria. So if it's difficult in Melbourne, how difficult, it is, how difficult is it in Cape York or in the Kimberleys to be able to access those sorts of reports uh, for children? So um, the, the people, particularly O'Brien and Fitzgibbon, who've been doing some work on this in Victoria, have found that Donnie Impacts fails really to provide uh, support um, for those young children who are coming into um, 
the juvenile justice system. There's also a number of developmental arguments, and I know there's other people going to talk about neuroscience, um, so I'm just going to deal with this very briefly. But it seems to me that there's three arguments around developmental issues. One's the general neuroscience, neurobio neurobiological evidence, uh, which suggests that our adolescent brains are not fully mature until they're in their early 20s. So that's kind of a general proposition around um, neuroscience. There's a second proposition that individual children of substantially identical age and demographics demonstrate very different cognitive capacities for understanding. So there's a, a general level of evidence around neuroscience. There's then specific evidence that individual children vary in terms of uh, their stages of development. And then there's a third proposition coming out of the literature, and that is that an individual child may show capacity to be able to tell right from wrong in some circumstances and not be able to do it in other circumstances. And the, and the child psychologists talk about hot and cold conditions. So you know, in a cold condition, the child may be able to, to discern, but in a hot condition where they've been surrounded by their peers and the excitement that's associated with that, they may not be able to make that distinction so clearly. So they're the broad developmental arguments. Um, and it seems that if we take those development arguments seriously, this idea of Dolly Inca packs of being able to demonstrate that the child really knew what they were doing was seriously wrong or not, it, it would involve the rigorous screening of, and assessment of all children between the ages of 10 and 14 who come into the children's court. Uh, and clearly many people would think that that's simply an unworkable proposition, uh, let alone uh, uh, one that would be likely to be put into practice. There's also an argument that if you're going to do this and take this seriously, it should also apply to diversion. Because if a child is subjected to a diversionary um, decision, it still assumes some level of legal understanding. And particularly with things like youth justice conferencing, the failure to actually comply um, with those undertakings can lead to uh, criminal justice uh, interventions. So again, it should, there's an argument that it should apply to diversion, not just in court. Um, mental health disorders and cognitive disability. Um, again, I know there's going to be other people talking about FASD and FASD study in, in WA, so I won't say too much about that, but just um, yeah, in terms of the evidence, there's very clear evidence about the high rates of uh, mental health disorders and cognitive disabilities among children. Uh, that are in detention uh, in particular and on community service orders as well, community-based options as well. So again, you know, these are children that are clearly slipping through any safeguard or any safety net that Dolly Incubax was supposed to provide. Um, just as some examples of that, um, New South Wales survey, 83% of young people in detention were assessed as having a psychological disorder. And again, that proportion was higher for Indigenous children than non-Indigenous children and much higher than you'd find in the community. Um, cognitive disability, 18% of um, young people in custody in New South Wales uh, were in the low range, um, indicating cognitive disability, uh, and about 39 to 46% were in the borderline range um, where there may be some effect on uh, cognitive function. And also, those, again, those rates were higher for Indigenous children. Um, <coughs> FASD study, I won't really say much about that because there are people going to be talking about it, but again, you know, it's, in, in summary, it found 36% of, of young people in detention, majority again of whom were Indigenous in WA, um, uh, had or had, were diagnosed uh, or had symptoms um, in relation to FASD, and nearly 90% uh, had uh, impaired functioning uh, in uh, one area of impaired functioning in relation um, to, to brain functioning overall. So, you know, the studies from across Australia are showing the same sort of results in terms of the level of mental health disorders or cognitive impairment of children that are in detention. Um, so that's a summary of the, the FASD study, but I, I know Rowan much is here. I think she's giving you paper letters. So. Um, so raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility is not going to solve all the problems associated with the criminalisation of children with mental health disorders or cognitive impairments, but, but it does open a door to not criminalising those very young children that fall into that area. 
and it also provides a space for considering how these young people should be responded to in the community um, <clears throat> rather than as, as presently happens where the criminal justice system itself becomes the, the kind of normalised place for managing uh, disability and mental health disorders. Another area is around, um, I suppose, the criminological arguments, if you like. We, many people in here will be completely aware that one of the greatest predictors of uh, ongoing and continued environment in juvenile justice and in the adult criminal justice system is the early age uh, of first conviction, an early age of the child going into the juvenile justice system. So the, longer, the earlier you go in there, the longer you stay. Uh, both in the juvenile justice system and then in the adult uh, criminal justice system. And there, there's very clear evidence around that. As part of this research, uh, we interviewed juvenile justice practitioners in Queensland and New South Wales, and really the overwhelming majority of people that we spoke to who work in juvenile justice don't think it's a good idea to be locking up children under the age of 14. Uh, I don't think we spoke to one juvenile justice detention centre manager uh, who was happy about having an under 14 year old in a detention centre. Now that might be partly because of management reasons, but I think it's also for reasons of, of, of clearly understanding the level of capacity that those young children might, be, might have. So one detention centre major from Queensland, children under 14 can and should be dealt with in another way. Uh, one from New South Wales, I think it's very young, youngest person who's been in one of our centres was 11. Well, that person might have a chronological age of 11. He could have been seven or eight. We really need to see where these young people are functioning. Uh, and really, across the board, when we spoke to people in, in juvenile justice in Queensland and New South Wales, there was very strong support uh, for raising the minimum age. And the work that I referred to in Victoria by O'Brien and Fitzpatrick found the same thing in Victoria in terms of practitioners. So I think there is quite a bit of support um, from a range of areas. Peter, I mentioned Peter Johnson before, the, the, the judge of the Children's Court, right down through to people who actually are working in the coalface of juvenile justice, who see the problems of the criminalisation uh, of young children. So how many children are we talking about? Um, well, 2015-16, uh, there were 878 under 14 year olds placed under community supervision throughout Australia over that 12 month period. Okay. Uh, and there were 599 under 14 year olds who went into juvenile detention throughout Australia over that year. So not on any one day, but over the year, that was the, they were the numbers. So we're talking about significant numbers of children uh, under the age of 14 who are coming into juvenile justice either placed on orders or placed in detention uh, and you can see there who the, uh, the, the chief offenders are in terms of the states. Queensland, WA and New South Wales come out uh, consistently uh, in relation to having young children in the system. And we know uh, in each of those jurisdictions the majority of children are Aboriginal children. So the minimum age of criminal responsibility as an Indigenous issue, of all of those uh, 40, under 14 year olds, the 599 placed in detention, 67% uh, were Indigenous children. And similarly, the same percentage for those that were placed on community based orders. That were under <coughs> very, very high. More than two out of every three children were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And if you look at the concentration of those that are under 12, it's even higher 73%. Uh, so basically, three out of every four children. Five minutes. Uh, were Indigenous children. This is so it's fundamentally an issue that needs to be uh, taken up and pushed uh, by Aboriginal people and Aboriginal organisations. Certainly changing the age will benefit all children, uh, but it has a very, very clear impact uh, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Um, so just in the last couple of minutes, I'll skip through that and yeah, there's a number of possibilities. Um, my view and what I argue for in this paper is that the minimum age should be raised to 14. Some countries have kept a relatively low age but put legislative barriers in place to prevent the detention of children. Um, that's one possibility. Um, 
other jurisdictions, other countries have put in um, a minimum age of 14, but had some exceptions for particular types of offences. So Hungary is an example, Ireland uh, is an example where Hungary it's 14, uh, but 12 uh, for serious offences such as homicide. What's the, perhaps, the best politically achievable option in relation to Australia? Um, probably, from my point of view, um, an absolute age of 14 would be the best option, but I don't know that it's politically achievable. Uh, I would expect that at the end, uh, they will, uh, whatever Attorney General picks, up, picks this up, will want to put in some exceptions. Uh, the New Zealand model has, uh, basically it has a minimum of age of 14, except for murder and manslaughter where it's 10, and for some other very serious offences where it's 12 and 13. But effectively, for the vast majority of children, the minimum age is 14 in New Zealand. If we think about man murder or manslaughter, um, when it's 10 years old, we, we would be unlikely to get more than one, maybe, maybe we would have, wouldn't even average one uh, murder or manslaughter a year involving a 10 or 11 year old. I mean, it's a relatively infrequent uh, event. It's better to have the New Zealand model than what the Northern Territory Royal Commission recommended because it's basically saying raise the age to 12 but only put a limit on detention for those under 14, which means that 12 and 13 year olds still go into court, still get convictions, it's just they can't be sent to detention under 14. But you know, if they build up a prior record and they go back after they're 14, you can bet they're going to go straight for the detention. So I think the New Zealand model is probably preferable uh, to um, what the NG Royal Commission recommend. So I think I'm probably, if not out of time, right at it. Yep. So look, I think I'll leave it at that. But there, the paper that I've um, done goes through in much more detail those, uh, let's get back to the beginning, eight or nine points in terms of an argument as to why we should be raising the age. Thank you, Professor. And as for the statement, for all the consenting presenters, Meg will be posting the presentations on Facebook, which you can then access through that.